Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Landlord Law Legal Cases webinar, where we're going to be talking about the uh, no DSS case with the barrister in the case, who is uh, Tessa Buchanan, another Tessa. Hello, Tessa. Hello. Um, we will be, um, Tessa will be taking us through the case and, and discussing the background in the case. Um, there is a chat box if you're on the live webinar, obviously, if you're watching the recording, that won't be available. If you do want to ask questions, note that we will only be um, answering questions if they are on the law. We're not going to be answering people's problems. So if, you, if you've got a question about the, the law, put it there and we'll, we'll, we may answer it or I may chip in and ask Tessa. Um, but um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, over to you, Tessa. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. So I've been asked to talk about the recent case of uh, Stephen Tyler and Paul Carr estate agents, uh, where I acted for Mr. Tyler, the claimant, uh, which is um, notable because it was the first contested trial in a no DSS case. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will be aware that there have been a number of challenges uh, brought to no DSS policies. Um, quite a few cases have been issued, uh, but this was the first case to get to a contested trial. And um, as I'm sure uh, many of you will know, the claimant, Mr. Tyler, uh, was successful in his claim. So I'm going to uh, explain the judgment, uh, the uh, reasons why the no DSS policy was found to be unlawful and um, think about any sort of implications that, that it may have going forward. So firstly, no DSS, uh, it's a really common phrase, which I'm sure uh, most people will be familiar with, um, but Whilst I don't think it needs much explanation, uh, in case it does, or in case, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I'm just going to there we are, um, delve into that a little bit more deeply. So no DSS is essentially uh, a phrase or a label or terminology used to indicate that applicants for a tenancy who are in receipt of benefits uh, won't be accepted. So this landlord or uh, this estate agency won't accept people on benefits. And it could be uh, that that applies to all benefits or just means tested benefits or even just housing benefit. Uh, and it can vary uh, in other ways as well. So it could be something, a policy which is adopted by uh, an entire estate agency or lettings agency or uh, by just one landlord or even just in respect of, of one property and it's important to remember that no DSS is a shorthand it's not a sort of magic formula what matters is that the, the practice underlying it and uh, it's it, even if you don't use the phrase no DSS that doesn't mean that that's not what's happening in practice. Um, I've sometimes sort of seen it suggested that, well, we'll just take out the words no DSS and then it'll be OK. Um, in my view, that's probably not correct. Uh, the point is, are you rejecting people just because they're on benefits? If so, what is in effect in existence is a, an ODSS policy or practice. So it's a matter of substance, not form. Uh, and the effect and what we would say the unfairness is, is that people are being rejected and not because of any problems with their particular application or their individual circumstances, but simply because they receive benefits. Uh, and this is a practice which could be formally written down somewhere, but it, it doesn't need to be. Uh, in Mr. Tyler's case, it was um, primarily communicated to him verbally uh, in a short phone call. Um, and in other cases, it's a little bit more on the nose and indeed uh, emblazoned in the window, um, but it doesn't need to be in order for it to e exist. And just as a, a brief reminder of the scale of these sorts of practices, 
uh, I set out some statistics and uh, surveys on the slide there, which show uh, both the longevity of no DSS uh, policies and also the uh, the reach of them. So in a uh, study done between 2003 and 2005, uh, Shelter looked at 13,000 uh, private rental sector advertisements. Of those, a third barred housing benefit claimants um, in the advert itself. And then when inquiries remained, were, were made with the remainder, only a sixth said that they would accept a housing benefit tenant. And then you can see that another survey done of a thousand landlords in 2013 found that 78% weren't willing to let to people uh, on housing benefit. In 2014, the uh, representatives of the National Landlords Association said that 52% of their members that they'd surveyed said they wouldn't take such applicants. And uh, another survey of just over a thousand landlords in 20, 20, uh, 19 to 20, so very recently, found that 41% of landlords uh, still said they had an outright bar on letting to housing benefit tenants and uh, a further 22% preferred not to. And of course, just the name no DSS itself is uh, indicative of how long standing this is as practice because it refers to the Department of Social Security, which was, of course, abolished in 2001. So, how has such a long-standing uh, and a widely established practice, how has it been challenged? One response uh, which is sometimes raised to um, the allegation that the, these practices are not lawful is, well, that there's no law against it. Uh, and we would say that's not exactly right. It's correct that there is no sort of law that says it is illegal to have an ODSS policy. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it is then lawful, because if it's in breach of some other legislation, then it won't be lawful. And uh, what Mr Tyler's case was saying was that it was in breach of some other legislation. It was in breach of the Equality Act 2010. And that's the act uh, under which the challenges to no DSS policies have been brought. I'm sure that everyone um, has at least heard of the Equality Act, and many of you may be very familiar with it. But I know that we, we do have quite a lot of, uh, of non-lawyers here today. So I'm going to just do a brief overview of, of how the Equality Act works before explaining how it relates to no DSS policies. So the Equality Act uh, came into force 1st of October 2010. And in fact, I think there is some um, events going on at the moment to mark its 10 year anniversary. What it does in broad terms is it makes certain unfavourable treatment unlawful in respect of certain protected characteristics. Or to put it another way, it makes it unlawful to treat certain people in certain um, less favourable ways. So the protected characteristics are set out um, at part two of chapter one. Then the types of unfavourable treatment are in part two of uh, chapter two. Sorry, ch that's chapter one of part two and chapter two of part two. Uh, and then the circumstances in which that treatment is not allowed are then set out in parts three to seven. And uh, how to take enforcement action is contained in part nine. So firstly, what are the protected characteristics? Well, they are set out on that slide. As you can see, they include age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. Uh, the ones which have been most relevant to date in no DSS cases have been disability and sex. And I'll, I'll come on to those uh, protected characteristics in, in a little bit more detail later. Um, not all those protected characteristics will apply in all circumstances. So sometimes unfavourable treatment is only prohibited in respect of some of those characteristics. Uh, but those are the starting points, um, the special statuses which are protected under the Act. Uh, and then what is the unfavourable treatment? Well, firstly, we have discrimination, uh, which is defined at sections 13 to 19 of the Act. And that's the one uh, on which I'll be focusing today. Uh, but just for completeness, there is also failing to make reasonable adjustments for disabled persons, harassment, 
and victimization. In terms of discrimination, there are two types of discrimination, um, two main types of discrimination, I should say. Uh, there are also some other uh, particular kinds of discrimination, but the two sort of broad categories are direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. When we think of uh, discrimination, I think most of us would tend to think of direct discrimination which is when someone treats someone unfavorably because of their protected characteristic. So, for example, someone saying you can't you can't come in here because um, of your race or you, you can't do this because of your sex or something like that. Uh, but. In addition to that, we also have indirect discrimination. Uh, and that's the one that I'll be most concerned with today. I've set out the basic definition of indirect discrimination uh, on the slide there and you can see it says a person A discriminates against another B if A applies to B a provision criterion or practice which is discriminatory in relation to a relevant protected characteristic of B's. And what uh, well, I'll come to a more detailed definition later uh, but in essence what that means is that if you have a policy uh, which impacts disproportionately on people with a particular protected characteristic and it can't be justified, then that is indirect discrimination. Uh, and, and to give you an example, um, as I said, if you had a rule which said, um, for instance, no women are allowed in this restaurant, then that would be direct discrimination because you're saying because of the fact that you're a woman you can't come into this restaurant but if you had a rule that said nobody under the height of uh, five foot eight is allowed in this restaurant then that would be indirect discrimination uh, and the reason for that is that women are generally uh, not all of them obviously but women are generally shorter than men so and so and therefore more likely to be under say five foot eight and therefore, uh, they're more likely to be prejudiced, to be caught by a rule that says nobody under five foot eight is allowed in here. So coming on to that more detailed definition of indirect discrimination, it's contained in uh, section 19.2 of the Equality Act. And it says for the purposes of subsection one, that was the provision that we just looked at uh, just on the previous slide. So for the purposes of that subsection, a provision, criterion or practice is discriminatory in relation to a relevant protected char characteristic of B's if A applies or would apply it to persons with whom B does not share the characteristic, it puts or would put persons with whom B shares the characteristic at a particular disadvantage when compared with persons with whom B does not share it, it puts or would put B at that disadvantage and A cannot show it to be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Uh, so, as you might be able to see from that, that breaks down into a number of different um, questions or, or requirements. Uh, firstly, you need to have a provision criterion or practice. Uh, secondly, B, so the claimant, for example, uh, must have a protected characteristic. Then the provision criterion or practice or PCP has to apply to persons who don't share that characteristic with B. So it's of... Uh, supposedly neutral application, but it puts or would put people with who with whom B shares that characteristic at a particular disadvantage when compared with people who don't share that protected characteristic. And then it puts uh, B at that actual disadvantage and it's not proportionate, i.e. A can't show it to be proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So in the example that I uh, gave under the previous slide of the rule saying nobody under the age of five, uh, under the height of five or eight is allowed in the restaurant. Um, that would be a PCP, that rule. Uh, and then if we have a, a pretend claimant, a B, uh, we'll say that she's a woman, so she has a protected characteristic of sex. Uh, the rule applies uh, to people with whom B shares that characteristic, uh, but also to people who don't share the characteristic. So it applies neutrally in that uh, it applies to both men and women, but it puts people with whom B shares a protected characteristic, i.e. women, 
at a particular disadvantage when compared with persons with whom B doesn't share it, i.e. men, uh, because women, I would say, um, are less likely to be able to meet the requirement, so they're more likely to be banned from the restaurant. And then the question is, was B, was the claimant put at that disadvantage? So, for example, she'd wanted to go to a restaurant but wasn't allowed in, or she'd wanted to go but was deterred from going because of the rule. And then the question would be, is it a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim? So can the restaurant owner show uh, that there's a good reason for it? If not, it amounts to indirect discrimination. Turning then to the circumstances where unfavourable treatment is prohibited, uh, and there are two that I'm going to highlight for our purposes today. Uh, firstly, Section 291, which is the provision of services to the public, uh, and that states that a person or service provider who is concerned with the provision of a service to the public or a section of the pu public, or whether for payment or not, must not discriminate against the person requiring the service by not providing the person with the service. And that applies to both uh, direct and indirect discrimination. And then secondly, disposing of premises, that comes under section 33.1. A person A who has the right to dispose of premises must not discriminate against another B as to the terms on which A offers to dispose of the premises to B by not disposing of the premises to B or in A's treatment of B with respect to things done in relation to persons seeking premises. Uh, and we say that those are relevant uh, because agents, letting agents provide services to the public, uh, landlords dispose of premises. And uh, of course, it may well be that landlords also provide services to the public or the agents uh, can dispose of premises. Uh, and the effect of those provisions is that when someone is providing services to the public or is disposing of their premises, then they, they mustn't discriminate. Can I just um, chip in here and say that we've had quite a few comments in the chat, um, which is basically on the justification for landlords um, having a no DSS policy. Um, for example, if the mortgage um, prohibits it or the insurers prohibit it. Do you want to talk about that now or do you want to talk about that later on? Uh, it's a good question uh, and I'll come to it uh, later on, uh, if I may, because I think it um, can be dealt with more clearly then. Uh, but I've made a note of it and I think it's actually in the slides already, but um, but I'll come back to that. OK, I just thought I'd mention it so that people listening know it's coming. Uh, so we will be discussing this aspect and um, we are aware of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising that. Uh, so then uh, just lastly on, on the Equality Act generally, uh, enforcement so uh, you can bring a claim uh, to the county court if you uh, think that you've been treated unlawfully under the Equality Act uh, you must bring that claim within six months although that can be extended by the court if it's just and equitable to do so and then if you succeed in the claim the county court can award um, any remedy which could be granted by the High Court in a claim for judicial review or tort uh, that includes a declaration uh, but also damages for injured feelings so turning now to the relationship between no DSS policies and the Equality Act 2010 uh, and why or, or the arguments as to why no DSS policies are unlawful under the Equality Act. Uh, as you will have seen in the slide uh, which set out the test for indirect discrimination under Section 19.2, um, there are a number of questions which have to be asked and answered uh, in order to establish a claim of indirect discrimination. Uh, in fact, I'll just go back to that slide briefly. Here we are. Uh, so uh, applying this to the circumstances of an ODSS PCP, um, does the defendant have a PCP? So for our purposes, that would be a PCP of not accepting applicants in receipt of benefits, does the claimant have a protected characteristic? Does the PCP apply to people without that protected characteristic? Does the PCP put people uh, with whom the claimant shares their particular protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage? Was the claimant put or would the claimant have been put at that disadvantage? And uh, was the PCP uh, nevertheless justified? So turning to the first of those questions, does the defendant have a PCB of not accepting applicants in receipt of benefits? Uh, the important point to note here is that 
PCP, provisional criterion or practice, uh, is given a wide interpretation. So it doesn't need to be something that is written down. Uh, it doesn't need to be a formal policy. Informal policies can suffice. Uh, it doesn't need to be something which is applied on every single applic uh, application. It doesn't need to be of universal application. And it can include even one-off decisions, provided there's a level of continuity as to how similar cases uh, would be dealt with. Uh, and this will be a question of fact, ultimately. Uh, is is it the case that uh, there is a practice in force that people on benefits aren't accepted? Uh, and if so, it, it may well amount to a PCP. And that's even if it's just on behalf of one landlord or, or even uh, just in relation to one property. The next question is then, does the claimant have a protected characteristic? I set out the various different types of protected characteristics on the previous slide and indicated there that disability and sex were the most likely to be relevant. Uh, they're certainly the ones which have been the, the subject of cases brought to date. Um, so disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment, which has a substantial and long term adverse effect on P, on the person's ability to carry out normal day to day activities. And an impairment is long term if it's lasted or is likely to last at least 12 months. Uh, there are other uh, details providing further definitions. So, for example, um, how to take into account the effect of medication, uh, certain conditions which are deemed to be disabilities. But those are the main points. And for the purposes of indirect discrimination, uh, it's not necessary for the defendant to, to know in advance that the claimant had that disability. Sex is defined as being a man or a woman, and that's at section 11. Um, so although those have been the protected characteristics which to date have been relevant, uh, other characteristics uh, may well apply uh, if, for example, people who um, or a particular uh, sexual orientation are more likely than people of other orientations to claim housing benefit, then uh, potentially that could be a basis for, um, for arguing that a PCP is uh, indirectly discriminatory as well. But those are the ones that we've seen to date. Uh, then does the PCP apply to people without that protected characteristic? Uh, this is generally not a controversial part of the case. Uh, all it means is that the PCP um, is of neutral application. Uh, so it doesn't just apply to, for example, women or disabled people. It applies to everyone. Um, sometimes there seems to be uh, a suggestion that the fact that the PCP applies to everybody, so it's nobody on benefits is allowed and not women on benefits aren't allowed. Uh, there seems to be a suggestion that, that is sort of a defence, um, but it's not because actually that's a crucial part of the definition of indirect discrimination. Um, the, the fact of the neutral application is what makes it indirectly discriminatory, not directly discriminatory. And that the key point is, does, does this apparently neutral policy actually have more of an in impact on a particular group than on others? And then that's the next question that we come to. Does the PCP put people with whom the claimant shares a protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage? And uh, as I'll uh, go on to, a uh, research which has been done by Shelter shows that, yes, that is the case. So the concept of, of particular disadvantage was considered quite recently by the Supreme Court in the case of ESSIP and the Home Office. And we uh, got a number of important points from that. Um, we know, firstly, that it's not necessary to explain why the PCP puts the group at a disadvantage. Now, sometimes, you know, that might be obvious. So in the example which I've been given, I, I've been giving of the rule that nobody under the height of five foot eight can go into a restaurant, it's pretty obvious that that's more likely to put women at a disadvantage because they're more likely to be shorter than men. But it, we don't need to show the reason. In the case of um, ESSIP, so that, that involved two joint cases, and, and one of the cases was uh, against a, uh, was brought in respect of a civil service assessment, and uh, civil servants who were of black and minority ethnic um, heritage were less likely 
to pass the test, uh, which they needed to pass in order to be promoted. And there was no obvious reason as, as to why that was the case. But the Supreme Court said it, it doesn't matter uh, why they were less likely to pass. Uh, so for the purposes of no DSS, BCPs, we don't need to be able to say why, for example, women or disabled people are more likely to claim housing benefit, although I'm, you know, we, we may well um, be able to come up um, with suggestions as to why. Uh, next, there doesn't need to be a causal link between the protected characteristic and the disadvantage. And again, this is why there's an important distinction between direct and indirect discrimination. So direct discrimination, treating someone badly because of their protected characteristic. Indirect discrimination, uh, it's not, uh, you don't need to show that someone is being treated differently because of their protected characteristic. Uh, and that's why, although we often um, see people saying, oh, well, you know, my, this, this rule has got nothing to do with uh, the claimant being a woman, that's, that's not really relevant. Um, the question is, does this policy put women or disabled people or other protected characteristics at a particular disadvantage? We don't need to show that it's because of the protected characteristics. We also know that, that it's not necessary for every member of the group to be put at the disadvantage. So we don't need to show that every single woman or every single disabled person claims housing benefit. Uh, the question is whether a larger proportion of that group do than people without a protected characteristic. And that question is uh, often shown by statistical evidence. So uh, in respect of no DSS PCPs in particular, research done by Shelter has shown that people who are disabled and women are more likely uh, than their counterparts to claim housing benefits. So in respect of disability, uh, disabled households in the private rented sector were almost three times more likely to claim housing benefit than non-disabled households. And when looking at the population more generally, so not just the private rented sector, disabled households were almost five times more likely to claim housing benefit than non-disabled households. And in respect of sex, women in the private rented sector were more than 1.5 times as likely as men to claim housing benefit. And in a way, that's the, the heart of the case, really. Women are significantly more likely than men to claim housing benefit, and disabled people are significantly more likely than non-disabled people to claim housing benefit. Uh, and as a result, uh, the argument is that they are put at a particular disadvantage by a no DSS policy. And I think this also just helps to highlight the unfairness of no DSS PCPs in that it's something which women and disabled people are much more likely to be caught by. And as I mentioned in respect to the previous slide, we don't need to show why or even that all disabled people and all women are affected. Um, and it doesn't matter, uh, uh, the counterpart of that, it doesn't matter that, you know, some men and some non-disabled people are also affected. The question is, uh, are more, uh, proportionately, are more men or are more, more women or more disabled people affected? Uh, and the evidence collected today shows that that is the case. Then the next question is, did the claimant suffer that disadvantage? Uh, and that can be in two ways. Firstly, was the claimant actually put at that disadvantage? So was the claimant told, uh, no, we're not going to take your application or we're rejecting your application because you're on benefits? Or was the claimant, would the claimant have been put at that disadvantage if they had gone for the opportunity? We know that indirect discrimination can occur where someone is deterred from doing something. Uh, the example given in the explanatory notes of the Act is deterred from applying for a job or taking up an offer of service because then a policy uh, would be applied which would result in his or her disadvantage. So uh, the question would be, uh, was the claimant either rejected because of their receipt of benefits or were they deterred from going for the tenancy uh, because of the existence of a, an ODSS PCP? And then the last question, which is, well, can it be justified? So even if all those criteria are met, it's still open to um, the person with the PCP to justify the policy. And that means showing that it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. The burden is on the defendant or the person with the, with the policy to justify it. And when the court is looking at an argument of justification, it will make up its own mind as to whether or not it's justified. Um, some of you may be familiar with judicial reviews and will know that uh, the court 
will if the court is considering a challenge that a particular policy is not reasonable then it will uphold the public body's public body's decision unless the decision is so unreasonable that no reasonable uh, local authority or public body could have come to it uh, but unlike in those cases there isn't a margin of discretion given to the defendant the court weighs up the factors and reaches its own view uh, it's probably an obvious point but the more serious the disadvantage the more compelling the justification has to be and also uh, costs alone can't justify discrimination so um, there must be something else to to justify the policy coming then to those questions which were raised uh, in, in the chat um, some common themes uh, to to justification are I'm worried that the rent won't be paid if I let to somebody on housing benefit or it will be a breach of my mortgage or my insurance doesn't cover it uh, now the um, our view is that none of those provide sufficient uh, justifications uh, for the policy uh, and as I'll come on to in the, in the Tyler case um, the policy wasn't found to be justified but dealing with those um, those sort of common common themes raised uh, firstly that housing benefit claimants are just too great a financial risk they'll fall behind on the rent they won't pay it well that that's not supported uh, by the evidence uh, that we've seen in fact, there was quite a recent YouGov survey showing that landlords who let to housing benefit claimants are, are no less likely to be profitable than the average. And it's important to remember as well that uh, challenges to no DSS PCPs are not saying you have to grant someone a tenancy whether or not they can afford it. All that they're saying is that every applicant deserves to be considered on their own merits and that you cannot simply assume that just because somebody receives benefits that means they can't afford the rent or they won't be a good tenant um, and in fact the cases today have all been brought by somebody who could have afforded the tenancy uh, that they'd applied for and of course many housing benefit tenants um, will have access to either savings or a guarantor or be in part-time um, or, or be in work so the the bottom line really is is simply that people should be looked at on their own merits and shouldn't be cut off by a blanket rule um, when they apply for a tenancy. Uh, secondly, I can't because it would be a breach of my mortgage. Uh, well, the evidence that we've seen shows that's very, very unlikely to be the case. Uh, in the same 2019-20 YouGov survey, uh, we saw that nearly 48% of landlords don't have a mortgage and over 95% of uh, lenders don't prohibit housing benefit tenants. So if there are mortgages still out there which prohibit these policies, they are in a very, very small minority. Uh, so they, in, in my view, wouldn't justify a blanket rule. Uh, and also uh, Section 142 of the Equality Act uh, says that uh, a contract, a term of a contract which is which promotes or constitutes unlawful um, treatment under the Act it is unenforceable. So we would say that that um, that even if there was a mortgage term in place, it couldn't survive at Section One Four Two. If I could just um, mention here, I mean, speaking on be behalf of the landlords, who who um, I'm sure will feel a bit unhappy about that. Um, even though perhaps most mortgages don't have those clauses, it, it is the fact that some do. And if a landlord does have a mortgage which has that clause, I think that that landlord will feel very unhappy about ignoring it because they might be at risk of foreclosure, for example, technically. And even if the clause is actually invalid under the um, under the equalities and discrimination legislation i don't think the landlord would would um, particularly um, want to have an argument with the mortgage company about it well i mean they may not want to but they also presumably don't want to be in breach of the uh, of the equality act and i mean from a practical point of view what may be a sensible thing to do is to go to the mortgage company and say 
look, this is a term in my mortgage. Um, I don't think it's lawful. Could, do you agree? And we know that uh, there's a case of uh, Helena Makalia, the uh, woman in Northern Ireland who challenged, I think it was Nat West, uh, and succeeded in in that. So um, whilst it's a matter for an individual, um, I think that there are a number of reasons why that can't be relied on as a defence, even if it is a live defence. And, and as we've seen, actually, there aren't really there are a very, very small minority of these uh, mortgage terms still out there. So I think it's probably um, I, I would be doubtful if it was enough to sort of sit back and say, well, it's, it's there without um, trying to at least take some action in respect of it are going to the mortgage lender and saying that this isn't right. I mean, just just a, an idea, you know, maybe some of the shelter um, solicitors could find out who these mortgage companies are and target them. Um, I think quite a lot of work has been done on that already. Yeah. I think that yeah. would be um, that would be a good thing because I think it's very unfair to expect a landlord who is indebted to the mortgage company to have to challenge them in this way. Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, but you could also sort of look at the the unfairness that results from no DSS PCPs. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, speaking on behalf of the landlords, yeah. um, they they would feel in a, they would feel they were between a rock and a hard place. You know, whatever they do is wrong, um, and it, and it is a very difficult position for them. Um, so anyway, we'll we'll leave that. But I, I think it's uh, I think it's something that um, uh, landlords are concerned about. It perhaps it's a minority of landlords, but it does happen, uh, and it is a problem that that needs to be investigated. I mean, I would really be surprised if it was um, as widespread an issue as it, um, it's sometimes uh, suggested to be, uh, because it's as a, you know, as I said, ninety-five percent of lenders don't prohibit housing benefit tenants, and um, a sizable, almost half of landlords don't have a mortgage anyway. Uh, so it's um, it's difficult to to see that that would justify taking a blanket policy that anybody who applies um, won't be allowed. And as I've said, um, it would be probably advisable to take some steps um, to take it up with the mortgage lender if, it, if you feel it's an issue in your case. I mean, somebody in the questions has just said that his buy-to-let mortgage has the clause that there should be no housing benefit tenants. Um, so it, it does happen. I mean, we don't want to spend too long on it, but it, <laughs> it is an issue. And I think it's something that ought to be flagged up. Yeah, oh, well, it'd be interesting to see what the response of the mortgage lender uh, was if that was raised. And obviously, I can't speak for shelter, um, but it may be that if if a landlord who did have this uh, pro provision in place wanted to challenge it, it may be that um, shelter could um, could provide some pointers as to how to do that, or even sort of write to the mortgage on their behalf. Obviously, as I said, I can't speak for them, but sure. that would be consider. I mean, it would be a good campaign to run. I mean, if, if people can let Shelter know who these companies are, maybe they can take some action. I mean, I know they have taken a lot of action to date, and that's why I've sort of diffidently made the suggestion that they, they may be willing to to help in future. Um, but, yes, yeah, certainly I know that, 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 that quite a lot of efforts have been made so, so far in respect of these, these terms, uh, which are now certainly much less common than they were. Uh, and the same uh, really applies in respect of insurance. Uh, firstly, it seems to be raised as an excuse much more often than it, it than it exists. Um, we know that only a very um, about twenty five percent of landlords have insurance covering non payment of the rent, uh, and we know also that insurance which does cover housing benefit tenants is is widely available. Um, and in any event, uh, section one four two says that. A, um, a term of the contract would be unenforceable if it promotes the Equality Act, uh, it promotes a contravention of the Equality Act. Uh, so, um, the so far, um, these these justifications have have not sort of really been substantiated uh, in in what I've seen. Um, I, I I I can see in the comments that um, there are quite a few people who are on the webinar who don't agree with that, um, and again, yeah. maybe insurance mm. companies who have these clauses could be challenged. I don't think it's fair to expect landlords to do this. 
and uh, in a way the insurance point is is even more important because you know if a landlord makes a claim they don't particularly want to fight their insurance company for for, for their payment because you know they're, they're obviously suffering loss um so again i think land I know there's only a minority of insurance companies that do this and, and maybe when taking out their insurance, this is something that um, that landlords ought to check and try and avoid these particular policies, but it doesn't alter the fact that it is an issue for landlords. Okay, um, so turning then to uh, Mr Tyler's individual case, um, so I'm going to uh, firstly, I've, I've set out sort of the background to the arguments uh, in that case, uh, and then now turning to the case itself. Um, so the claimant, Mr. Tyler, uh, was a gentleman with mental and uh, physical health disabilities. Um, he uh, was in a wheelchair. He, uh, he was a married man with, uh, by the time of trial, four children. Uh, and he was made homeless after his uh, landlord in the private renter sector accommodation he'd been living in, uh, refused to make disability accessible adaptations to his property. Um, and so he had to leave and he and his wife uh, searched for accommodation, but they uh, were unable to find any anything for a period of uh, over six months. Uh, they had applied as homeless, but they hadn't uh, been offered anything suitable uh, by the council. Um, and during this time, Mr. Tyler actually uh, slept in his car but because whilst his wife was able to live with her parents, uh, Mr. Tyler wasn't able to do so. Uh, and they were repeatedly rejected uh, by agents because of their receipt of benefits. The approach to the agent in this particular case uh, was made on the 7th of September 2018 in a telephone call. And Mr. Tyler's case was that he called the agent to inquire about three properties, which it was advertising as being to let. Uh, he was told that none of the properties accepted benefits uh, and then that it was company policy that we do not accept DSS. Uh, there were then some subsequent messages on Facebook. Uh, Mr. Tyler had messaged the defendant saying, do you accept housing benefit? And he'd received a response saying, uh, we can consider applications from applicants in receipt of housing benefit provided the affordability threshold is determined by the referencing provider is met. Unfortunately, housing benefit is not considered as part of the household's income for referencing purposes. However, many other DWP payments, for example, tax credits, pension, disability living allowance, a personal independence payment, carers allowance can be included. The landlord has the final decision on any application. Uh, Mr. Tyler then went to see solicitors who wrote to the defendant setting out his version of events. Uh, and received a reply saying, I'm pleased to advise you that we have reviewed our procedure for handling potential applicant inquiries with regard to housing benefit. Inquirers are now advised the following, which we hope will bring clarity to the matter. Uh, and then it set out the same blurb as, as had been set out in the Facebook message, that applications from applicants in receipt of housing benefit uh, could be considered provided the affordability threshold was met, but unfortunately housing benefit wasn't considered as part of the household's income for referencing purposes although many of the DWP payments could be included. Uh, the claimant solicitor asked for some proof that housing benefit wasn't considered as part of a household's income for referencing purposes, um, to which they received a response saying it wasn't considered because it could be legally withdrawn at any time and it was awarded by reference to income rather than being part of someone's income. Uh, and they enclosed a copy of uh, what was said to be a relevant page from the referencing agency's uh, guidelines document although the document didn't actually say anything about housing benefit. Uh, the claimant solicitors then contacted the referencing agency who said, we don't have any standards in place to automatically reject any application uh, and all applications are processed on a case by case basis. And then uh, Mr. Tyler's solicitor sent um, a letter for action uh, and then issued the claim, which was lodged in March, 2019. That was followed by a defence filed in September 19, which took issue with a large number of features of the case. It denied that there had been any telephone call, uh, or if there was a telephone call, denied that it was as Mr Taylor had described. It denied that the claimant had been told anything that was inconsistent with what the referencing agency had said. 
It denied the existence of a PCP. Uh, it said that if there was a PCP, it applied equally to all uh, to all recipients of housing benefit. Uh, that the referencing agency had commercially justified criteria for its referencing process, which had been followed. Uh, denied that the PCP put disabled people at a disadvantage uh, and said that it would be justified uh, because the aim was the commercial objective of having an effective re referencing process that serves the interests of landlord and also denied that the claimant had been uh, genuinely homeless when he'd made the application. The trial took place uh, almost exactly two years after the phone call on the 8th of September of this year uh, in front of Her Honour Judge Stacey who's now a High Court judge um, but of course was then a circuit judge who sat with an assessor who'd been appointed um, under section 114 of the Equality Act 2010. The issues at the start of trial were, did the defendant reject the claimant because he received housing benefit? If so, did this uh, put disabled people at a particular disadvantage? If so, was it justified? And if not, what relief should be granted? Um, at the trial, uh, the defendant um, made a, a sort of series of concessions really. Um, and by the time of the judgment, the legal issues had, as described by the judge, had crumbled to dust. Uh, and the defence was essentially, Mr Tide is not telling the truth. Um, but as, uh, as I've said, Mr Tyler succeeded. So the judge accepted his evidence of the telephone call on the 7th of September 2018 and found that there had been a blanket policy in respect of the three properties that he'd inquired about not to accept housing benefit applicants. Uh, that was supported, uh, the judge found, by the Facebook message uh, because the defendant's response to that had been equivocal, hedged with qualifications and caveats as to when applications from people on housing benefit would be considered. And also the response, the first response to Mr Tyler's solicitor had appeared to concede that such a policy had been in operation when Mr Tyler called. Uh, the judge accepted that the criteria at uh, section 19.2 of the equality were met, so the policy amounted to a PCP. It was a mutual application. It put disabled people at a particular disadvantage. It had put Mr Tyler at that disadvantage and the defendant had not shown that it was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So just a few points to highlight about the judgment. Um, firstly, this was a case where the existence of the no DSS PCP had been denied. Uh, this wasn't a case where there was um, a clear written policy set out in writing. Uh, and an important part of the case was what, what had happened during the telephone call, uh, but Mr. Tyler obviously still succeeded. Uh, the judge didn't make any findings that the defendant had a, a no DSS PCP in respect of all the properties on the books, of just the three properties that the claimant had inquired about, uh, which goes back to my point that it, it doesn't need to be a company-wide policy. Uh, it can apply even in just relation, uh, even in relation just to one property. Uh, and there had also been an argument made on behalf of Mr. Tyler that if the policy was, we can consider applications from applicants in receipt of housing benefit provided the affordability threshold is met, but unfortunately housing benefit isn't considered as part of the household's income for referencing purposes, uh, then this in itself amounted to a no DSS PCP. And the reason for that, uh, as, as argued, was that housing, by def housing benefit is by definition paid to people who can't afford the rent without it, uh, at least in the vast majority of circumstances. So if you have a rule that says we'll only consider people who can afford the rent without housing benefit, uh, then what in effect what you have is a no DSS PCP. Uh, the judge didn't make any kind of final determinations on that argument. Uh, she didn't need to because of the findings that had been made. Uh, but she did indicate in an obiter, so not not part of her um, sort of the, not part of the reasons for her judgment, uh, that if that policy had been applied, then it may well be susceptible to legal challenge on the same grounds. So it comes back to what's the effect in practice? Are you in practice excluding people on housing benefit? If so, uh, that may well be an ODFS PCP. Turning then to the remedies awarded. So the judge uh, made a declaration that the defendant unlawfully indirectly discriminated against the claimant by applying to him the provision criterion or practice of refusing to consider applicants in receipt of housing benefit for three private rented properties that were being marketed by the defendant. Uh, 
Uh, the judge awarded Mr Tyler damages of £6,000 plus interest. She found that it was a serious matter that had damaged Mr Tyler's feelings quite considerably uh, and that uh, the injury to his feelings was aggravated by the manner in which uh, the defendant had conducted the proceedings. And the judge also awarded Mr Tyler his costs on an indemnity basis, uh, which means that uh, any doubt as to whether or not his legal costs were reasonable would be resolved in favour of the receiving party and not the paying party, as on the standard basis, uh, to mark that they're, they're awarded essentially to mark the court's disapproval of the way a case has been conducted uh, or brought. Um, she said that the, the defence case was hopeless and couldn't possibly have succeeded. Um, so we can see that a, a sizable amount of damages, uh, as well as a sort of punitive costs order, uh, were the result in that case, as well as obviously the declaration. So what's the context for this and, and where are we going next? Uh, I, I'd want to deal firstly with some quite common responses that are made where to, to arguments that no DSS PCPs are unlawful. Uh, firstly, there's the freedom of contract argument. So it's my property and I'll let it to whoever, whoever I want to let it to. Um, in my view, that's that's just a, that's just wrong. That, that's fundamentally misconceived um, because there are limits set by Parliament uh, on the way that letting agents and landlords can conduct their business. So I'm sure that everyone here is aware of the right to rent, which says that properties can't be let to people with particular immigration statuses and the Equality Act is another example of that. It's a limit set by Parliament as to how public services can be provided or how premises can be disposed of. Uh, then there's something that is sometimes heard from agents who say we were just uh, following the landlord's instructions uh, but that's not in my view uh, a sufficient excuse because if those instructions are unlawful uh, then they they shouldn't be followed. And in fact, there is guidance from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which says explicitly that as well as not unlawfully discriminating against a client yourself, you must not accept an instruction to discriminate from a property seller or landlord. If you accept an instruction from a property seller or landlord to discriminate in disposing of housing premises, which includes letting or selling, this would be against equality law and the person could bring a legal claim against you. Uh, sometimes it's said, um, how can this be discrimination? It had absolutely nothing to do with the applicant being a woman. And I think I've dealt with that all, already, but I just sort of flag it again there. Um, it doesn't matter because we're talking about indirect, not direct discrimination. So the, the impact is the particular disadvantage upon a group of people with a particular characteristic. Uh, a quite similar one, um, how can we have discriminated? We didn't even know that the applicant was disabled. Um, well, again, not only is it about the impact on, on the group, uh, but also knowledge of disability isn't a prerequisite of indirect discrimination. A receiving housing benefit isn't a protected characteristic. Um, no, that's, that's correct, uh, but it doesn't need to be, because again, the point is, do more disabled people or more women or more of another protected characteristic receive housing benefit? Uh, and then finally, um, well, lots of our tenants are on housing benefit. Uh, and in my view, again, that doesn't really matter uh, because uh, it doesn't have to be a company wide policy um, or, you know, the whole portfolio of, of properties. If there is a PCP in respect of even just one property saying all people on benefits are um, will be rejected, then that may well amount to a, a PCP. As people may be aware, um, although this is the first uh, case to have gone to a contested trial, there have been a number of other no DSS cases um, which have resolved in, in favour of the claimant. Uh, and I've given some of them there. You can see Rosie Kioff settled with admission, uh, damages and costs. Emma Loeffler settled with an apology, damages and costs. Amanda Staples, apology, compensation and costs. And in the case of Jay, a declaration was made by consent that the agent's former no DSS policy was unlawfully indirectly discriminatory on the grounds of sex and disability with damages and costs paid. Uh, and although, although the declaration was, as I've said, made by consent, um, the judge uh, wouldn't have made it, I think it can be safely said, uh, if 
if she hadn't thought that it was correct to do so. Um, so although you know these, these are obviously settlements, um, I think they are significant uh, because they do show that these policies are being successfully challenged, um, even if it doesn't get all the way to a full trial. So looking ahead, um, the judgment was uh, by a circuit judge, uh, although um, she is now, as I've said, being promoted to the High Court, and I, I think at the time was acting designated civil judge. Um, so it's binding, uh, so it's not binding, but it is persuasive um, on, on other judges, persuasive authority. Um, in terms of the implications for people who don't have the protected characteristics of um, being a woman or being disabled, uh, sometimes the question is raised, well, does that mean that we can apply these policies, for example, to men or to non-disabled people? Um, now, it's obviously correct, as I've said, that the cases today have been brought by women and by disabled people uh, because the statistics show they're more likely to uh, claim housing benefit. Um, but does that mean that you can then operate a no DSS policy against uh, a man or a non-disabled person with, with impunity? Uh, and in my view, the answer to that would, would have to be no. Um, firstly, you don't necessarily know when you get an approach what the status of the person is, so you don't necessarily know their sex or, or whether or not they're dis disabled. Uh, so if you, you you can't say when you apply it, um, you, you can't necessarily say that the person who, who it's being applied to doesn't have a relevant protected protect characteristic. Uh, but the other reason would be that if you have a policy that says we uh, accept people on housing benefit, but we don't accept men on housing benefit, then you may well find that that strays into direct discrimination because you've got a particular policy, but you're, you're essentially treating someone differently on the basis of their sex. Uh, so um, I think that, that may well be a difficulty also. Um, and then are, are we looking at a developing consensus? Uh, and uh, in, in my view, we are. Uh, there seems to be a I can see not 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 from everybody in the seminar, uh, but there seems to be um, quite widespread agreement that no DSS PCPs um, are indefensible and, and shouldn't be applied, and that's from organisations such as um, I think the the RLA, the Residential Landlords Association, have said so, the National Landlords Association, uh, Right Move and Zoopla, uh, and of course members of um, the Conservative government, so the previous minister. For housing and homelessness as well as the previ previous minister for family support uh, housing and child maintenance so we, we're now looking at obviously a number of subtle cases a declaration by consent and a judgment from a contested trial uh, as well as what i would say is a, a developing consensus uh, that no dss pcps are are not acceptable um so i, I put a question mark there uh, but i think that the sort of wind does seem to be blowing uh, in one particular direction. Okay, um, well thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any other questions that people uh, may have uh, and anyone, thanks for listening. Okay, um, there have been an awful lot of questions and comments and um, as we don't particularly want this webinar to go on forever I think we'd have to be quite selective. Um, one question that has been asked which I think is very relevant is what can a landlord do um, to protect themselves. I mean, land, landlords, um, what, what is the, the, the correct way that they should treat an application when it comes in for a property? Uh, well, as I've sa said, the, the underlying theme, theme to sort of no DSS challenges is that people should be assessed on the basis of their own merits. So blanket policies are often problematic. Uh, we've looked at the reasons why no DSS blanket policies um, are uh, uh, were, were found uh, in, the, in the Tyler case to, to have been unlawful in that case. Um, and I think, you know, all blanket policies have to be treated with a great deal of caution. So it's a sort of fairly fundamental rule of fairness that just treating all applications on their on their own merits, really. 
So if if an if an application comes in for a property, if they if they treat them all the same, and they don't they don't um, treat an application where they find someone is on benefit any differently, they would be okay. Um, it's the so the automatic rejection of people on benefits simply because they're on benefits. Yeah. Is, the underlying problem with no DSS. I mean, if, if a landlord has two applicants to a property and one of them is on DSS and one of them has a job and they genuinely feel that the person who has a job would be the better tenant, will they be at risk for choosing the person in the job with the job? I mean, they presumably they don't have to choose someone on benefit because simply because they've applied and there's this no DSS rule. Um, I mean, Sounds like a silly question, but uh, I, I suspect some landlords are a bit worried by it. Um, well, it's I'm sort of keen not to be drawn into hypothetical scenarios because it's always yeah. difficult to know what all the factors are, and you know it, it off, it's often fact dependent. Um, but I think if your kind of lodestar is that uh, automatically rejecting people because they're on benefits uh, is um, in my view, a, a breach of the Equality Act, then I, I think that's a sort of helpful starting place. I'm, I'm not um, keen to sort of set out a step-by-step -step process as to how applications should be dealt with, because I think just situations vary quite wild, quite, quite widely. Um, but having a blanket policy in, in place to reject any particular group uh, because of some characteristic um, may well get you into difficulty and as we've seen with with no dss ones it's problematic yes i mean it, it i suppose we ought to say that this is a, a a county court decision isn't it so it's there there will probably be other cases in the future maybe the court will come to a different decision or maybe a court will clarify um in in future cases perhaps circumstances where I don't know, maybe it may be justified, maybe it's not. Um, so this isn't the end of the line, but this is just this particular case. And the purpose of this webinar is to, to talk about this case and, and to say what happened. Yeah, so as I said, the, it's a decision of a circuit judge. So um, it's uh, persuasive, it, it's not binding. Um, and um, it's, it's possible, yes, that there will be other cases. Uh, I obviously can't sort of speculate as to, to why, as to what judgment would be reached. But um, you know, I've, I've set out the arguments as to why these policies, uh, as, as to why, as to why these policies aren't lawful. Um, and um, we've that that's been agreed with by uh, not just Honourable Judge Stacey, but also by the judge who made the declaration in the J case. Uh, uh, as well as obviously the settled cases that I've referred to. Mm -hmm. I think probably we'd better leave it there. There have been quite a few questions that we've had on other examples of discrimination, but I think it's probably a bit unfair to ask you those because you haven't you haven't prepped those because you're just talking about this specific case uh, yes. and what this case was about. So I'm I'm, I'm sorry everybody who's asked other questions um, on different types of discrimination. But I think probably that the principle from this is that you just need to deal with all applications on their merits and not refuse somebody just because they're a, a DSS tenant. I mean, one of the things that I've been saying to, to, to some of my landlords is that in the current circumstances where people on jobs may lose their jobs, it may be that uh, a tenant who's been on benefit for quite a few years and has paid absolutely regularly and hasn't had any defaults at all, they, they may actually be a better bet than someone on a job because they've got a history of payment. So, you know, it, it may perhaps be foolish to, uh, to reject someone on benefit because you may be turning away a really, really good tenant who could be there for a very long time. So um, that's something also to be taken into account. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, I think perhaps we'll leave it there. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much, Tessa, for coming along and explaining the case to us. Quite a contentious case. Um, yes, from, uh, from many of the comments that we've had. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that, is, that is the case, you know. I mean, uh, Tessa isn't responsible for the judge's decision. She's just the barrister who, who argues the case.
Um, so thank you very much for coming along and explaining it to us. I'm sure it's not going to be the end of the story. I dare say we will have other cases um, on this topic in the future, in which case, hopefully, we will be able to have another webinar where we can get the barrister in the case along to, to explain it to us. So um, I'm going to close down now. Thank you very much indeed, Tessa, and to everybody who has attended. And I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.